open ocean. Only the reckless would even consider trying to fly over it. And yet, in 1919, two foolhardy British aviators left Newfoundland, Canada, in a converted bomber. Pilot John Alcock and navigator Arthur Whitten Brown sat in an open cockpit, battling iced wings, thick fog, and a stalled engine. After 16 hours, they crash-landed into an Irish bog. They were the first to fly across the Atlantic in a single flight. Despite their inglorious arrival, Alcock and Brown were immediately knighted and presented with a £10,000 fortune in prize money. For all pioneer aviators, the Atlantic remained the next frontier. You did it because of the romance, the challenge, the glory that was going to come of it and because you were committed to seeing something like that happen in terms of the advancement in aviation. Over 50 attempts to follow Alcock and Brown failed fatally by the mid-1930s. The most famous crossing came in 1927. Flying solo, a young American endured the hazards of sleep exhaustion and freezing weather for over 33 hours before arriving in Paris to mass public adulation. His name was Charles Lindbergh. The 20s was a time of heroes, and Lindbergh was probably the greatest of all heroes. And his achievement of flying across the North Atlantic romanticized air travel romanticized the future of aviation. It brought public focus on it. One man who quickly caught Lindbergh's attention was American aviation entrepreneur Juan Tripp. In 1927, Tripp acquired Pan American Airways and with Lindbergh's help, set about turning Pan Am into America's first international airline. The squalid competition between airlines within America was not for him. Tripp had bigger ambitions and looked to the world. He built Pan Am on a unique global vision. He was absolutely confident that he could make aviation a business, and it hadn't been a business until that point. Still only 28, Tripp quickly established the first airmail service outside the United States, flying from Florida to Cuba because it was post, rather than passengers, that built the world's airlines. Air Mayo was the basis on which all early aviation was developed. It was the subsidy in effect that made it possible to develop air routes. The air mail contracts meant that Pan Am would be paid by the pound, and for each mile it delivered the mail over. Vital revenue if you were after profit as well as places. Air mail played a big part. As a matter of fact, I think uh, we couldn't have done it uh, without the airmail subsidy. That was a big part of our income. Up to 1939, airmail would supply three quarters of Pan Am's revenue. Pan Am's rival in the growing international airline business would be Britain's Imperial Airways. The British tackled the airline building business rather differently. In 1924, the government created this state airline, run purely for the national interest and publicly funded by subsidies and airmail contracts. Imperial Airways was born out of a collection, a motley collection really, of four main carriers, all of which were receiving massive subsidies from the British government. The British government thought that this was not really a very satisfactory arrangement and something better could be done especially as we were trying to do a flag-waving job around the world. Imperial Airways' mission was to go global and connect the empire. To fly east and south to India, South Africa and Australia, and westwards to Canada, which would mean crossing the Atlantic. The 
The only problem was these pioneering international airlines lacked planes that could cross the oceans and the runways to land them on. But everywhere the airlines looked, there were oceans, rivers, and lakes with ready-made ports and docks. Why not develop a long-range plane, a flying boat, that could land on the water? Wherever you had water, there was a landing spot. Even going across the country, uh, you'd probably have more places where you could set down in the water uh, than on land. The age of the flying boat was born. The story of air transport really is the story of the flying boat. It grew to the point where there were main docks, uh, proper airline terminals, most suitable for water-based aircraft. And designers were the busy designing flying boats. By the early 1930s, flying boats came in many shapes and sizes, but the basic idea remained the same. A ship-shaped fuselage that could land on water and carry the mail over a long distance. Some worked, others didn't. But they all came to symbolize national pride. The Germans had the biggest one, apart from the Italians, who couldn't even take off. Then Mussolini sent 24 to the US as a symbol of his resurgent fascist power. There were both biplanes and monoplanes, but all flying boats had to have enough power to lift their huge weight off the water and enough range to fly long distances. Flying boats were, in their day, the most important element of long-range international air transport. In 1929, Imperial Airways started using flying boats to cross the Mediterranean as part of their pioneering air service to India. Pan Am quickly acquired several flying boats and nearly 40 amphibians, a plane that could take off from the land or water. Armed with his new fleet, Tripp planned to launch his dream of a global airline with expansion into the Caribbean and South America. But before he could start any services, Tripp had to win permission to land and operate in the countries he wanted to serve. This would not be easy as all governments jealously guarded these valued landing rights. In order to get them, Tripp led the way personally. And taking along the superstar of the age couldn't hurt. Mr. and Mrs. Lindbergh and Mum and Dad together flying, and, and obviously Lindbergh in those days was a national global hero. The two of them were 28 or 29 years old, and you think of the awfully heady experience for two young guys like that. Along the way, Mrs. Betty Tripp kept a journal. 9,000 miles in three short weeks. What a trip. Flying over jungles, charting new routes, meeting colonial governors and Latin American officials. Lindbergh was the hero of the world, and everyone was wildly eager to see him. On this and other visits, Tripp succeeded in opening doors closed to others. Tripp managed to get the route rights to places where others never quite made it, for some political reason or some other reason. Most important and exciting of all has been to see Pan Americans set the stage for the show that is just getting underway. By the mid-1930s, Pan Am ran over half the flights in Latin America and had delivered tons of mail. For Tripp, good business meant never limiting your ambitions. I think he always had the vision to go well beyond Latin America. The vision of Europe, the vision of the Pacific was there. I know it was there even as early as 1928. On the other side of the world, Imperial Airways had begun to serve India and South Africa. But the great oceans still lay between and ahead of the airlines. 
which will be the first to carry people over the most challenging ocean of them all. The Atlantic beckoned. Dispatch managers, they're the synchronized people. They know an early morning delivery is guaranteed. They can track their packages like air traffic controllers. They can tell you precisely when customs are cleared, even predict what's arriving next morning and when. Dispatch managers, synchronized people. UPS, synchronized shipping. With car insurance from More Than, you can protect your maximum no-claim bonus for life, whatever happens. To protect your no-claim bonus for life, don't accept less than more than. Call 0800 300 202. Who opens the door to all kinds of homes? Who offers mortgages that can be hand-picked by you? Cheltenham and Gloucester. Contact CNG or Lloyd's TSB for flexible mortgages built around you. <laughs> HP Technology and HP People help BMW Williams run every race before the driver ever gets in the car. With a strong unibody construction, and unique five-year warranty. There's no weak link in our chain. Hyundai, always there for you. I ho! I ho! I ho! I ho! I ho! I ho! I suppose I'd be much good at that. <laughs> Use your head. Teach. Natalie Evans has six frozen embryos, fertilized by her ex-boyfriend. Given Mr. Johnston's separation from Miss Evans, he would not now elect to have a child with her. He was my last chance of ever having a child of my own. Cutting Edge follows the moral dilemma that led to a landmark court case. Thursday at 9 on 4. In the early 1930s, Juan Tripp was determined that his airline, Pan Am, would fly across the Atlantic. But before he could start any services, he had to secure landing rights. He found that he could not make deals with the Europeans as he had with the South Americans. And so he was forced to turn his attention to flying in the other direction, across the Pacific. Starting service across the Pacific was clearly not easy. Many people, including people on Dad's board, 
thought he was a lunatic to undertake something of this magnitude, to try to fly from San Francisco 20-odd hours out across into the Central Pacific, find, try and find Honolulu. It was an extraordinary undertaking. Equipped with a new generation of long-range flying boats, in 1935, Tripp personally dispatched the first airmail flight right across the Pacific. Pan American Airways China Clipper, Captain Music, standing by for orders, sir. Captain Music, you have your sailing orders. Cast off and depart from Manila. Tripp gasped as Captain Music had to fly the overloaded China Clipper under the Oakland Bay Bridge and then over San Francisco's unfinished Golden Gate Bridge. Sixty flying hours, 8,200 miles and four stops later, he landed in the Philippines. Now U.S. posted mail would reach Hawaii in less than a day, and Manila in a week instead of a month, and Pan Am had the contract to deliver it. And as flying boats got bigger and more powerful, it became easier for them to carry people as well as post on long-haul trips. The flying boat in the mid-30s was one of the most romantic experiences anybody could have. They were clipper ships, but they flew. Those planes were absolutely a fantastic experience. Pan Am's flying boats would all be named clippers in homage to the great 19th century sailing ships that preceded them in conquering the world's oceans. And by 1937, Pan Am spanned the whole Pacific, reaching Hong Kong in Asia. Pan Am used to recite all the firsts it had, and it was certainly first to cross the oceans, first to have heated meals. Pan Am always felt it was the leader in creating new services, new levels of luxury. And the passengers certainly would have felt they had paid for every trouble Pan Am took to amuse them. Tickets for the Pacific flights cost the equivalent of well over 10,000 pounds in today's terms really was a Rolls-Royce service for society's elite. We carried a lot of Hollywood people between San Francisco and, and Honolulu. And I remember one flight where we had six berths in the back, and they were $2,200 for each berth. Please do it, <laughs> even educated flea. The presser came running up and said, there's a lady's bare leg sticking out between the curtains in that upper bunk. Somebody better do something. It seemed not all of Hollywood's leading ladies wanted to be alone. So needless to say, something was done, but we, we always regarded that as a kind of a wild incident in the upper bunks. Seeing the greatly increased capabilities of Pan Am's new Pacific flying boats and facing new competition into the Far East, Imperial Airways decided in 1935 it was time to invest in some new technology of their own. It commissioned Short Brothers, Britain's leading flying boat manufacturer, to design a new class of flying boat that could carry 24 passengers in luxury, as well as a ton and a half of the profitable airmail. Imperial was so impressed with his magnificent design and in such a hurry to compete that they ordered 28 straight off the drawing board. The order had quite an impact on the Short's workforce. You know, it was very difficult to believe. 20 out something flying boats, because Short's existed on orders of one and two. But to have an order of 20 odd flying boats can't be true. Hugh Gordon joined Short Brothers as an apprentice in 1929, working in their Rochester plant on the Medway River in Kent. He went on to test fly and troubleshoot 
of a new fleet of aircraft that would become famous around the world as the Empire Flying Boat. Another of Britain's giant new Empire Flying Boats is undergoing her final trials before being put into service. Like her previous sister ships, the Centaurus has cost over £40,000 and will carry 24 passengers, sleeping and waking, over the Empire's air routes. And as she takes off, yet another is brought out of the hangars for the first time. Winged monsters, maintaining Britain's supremacy in the air. And the crews of these great winged ships had to learn how to be sailors as well as pilots. A number of the captains, of course, are very experienced pilots, but they were not used to flying boats and manoeuvring on the water, for instance, something quite new to them. The crews had to be taught how to cast a line and moor at the bow, to navigate with a sextant and the stars, and to master all the rules of the sea. By 1937, the Empire flying boats delivered the mail to all the British imperial territories, except Canada and the Americas. For the tiny elite of very wealthy passengers or high-ranking officials who were able to afford the ride, it was a journey they would never forget. The short C-class Empire flying boat. Many passengers still believe they were the most comfortable aircraft ever built. And many still look back nostalgically to that moment of anticipation before takeoff, when you looked ahead to a leisured flight, to the night stops at Luxor, to the sight of Lake Victoria or Karangi Creek beneath the wingtip float. When we were told that we were flying back to India and that we were going on a flying boat, we were very, very excited. Had we really known what lay ahead with the trip, we would have been even more excited. In the late 1930s, 13-year-old Pepita and her 11-year-old brother Desmond were about to have the adventure of their young lives. When we saw the aircraft floating on the water, it was like a huge bird, and we didn't have much time to sort of look at it before being taken into the aircraft and then settled down at our seats. Their journey would take them halfway around the world to India, where their parents lived. The earlier flying boats had fixed seats, many of them made by the people who made the aeroplanes, you know, in other words, very good at making aeroplanes, not so good at making seats. But the adjustable seats on the Empire flying boats were very spacious, very comfortable. One could fall asleep in them without any difficulty at all. The takeoffs were very, very exciting because the spray just shot past the windows. And then up and away. They almost took themselves off the water. They really did. They were quite easy to fly, contrary to what a lot of people thought. The controls were nicely harmonized, and one got used to them very, very quickly. Wish I could do one now. <laughs> Delightful. They really were. Imperial Airways became a byword for luxurious service. The passengers had cocktails mixed by barmen recruited from the smartest London clubs. The staff, Imperial Airways staff, the ground staff and the cabin crew, they were very, very courteous to everybody. We were all treated like VIPs. The food that was served was served more like, almost like in a restaurant. The promenade deck was a part of the aircraft, the seats were only on one side. So people could get up and stretch their legs and look out of the window. That was a great advance on any aeroplane flying at the time and better than most flying today. 
The route to India went in stages, over France and then to Rome. And because each stage ended with a stopover, the passengers would disembark and stay overnight in luxury hotels. Their second stopover would be in Egypt. The flying boats always landed on the water at about five o'clock in the evening. And the passengers were taken ashore uh, by launch. At Alexandria, some of the passengers left us because they were traveling now on a different route down to East Africa and South Africa. For Pepita, the journey continued across the Middle East to Basra, Iraq. Going over Iraq, that was very bumpy, very hot heat rising from the desert and everybody felt rather sick but it was about the only time anybody ever did feel sick if I remember and on to Karachi then in India we were very very sad when our journey came to an end because it had been so unusual so extraordinary it was an epic journey it took four days four nights every night was in a different country and we were just very sorry when it was all over. It was a wonderful, magical dream which suddenly came to an end. And aboard this 60,000 pound flying hotel, life is smooth and comfortable. The hours pass luxuriously in almost silent safety. By the late 1930s, it was possible to reach India in four days. South Africa in five, Hong Kong in six, and Australia in an extraordinary nine days. By sea, it took over four weeks. But this progress and luxury only came as a result of a constant struggle between the crew and the elements. In March 1937, the Capricornus, a brand new Empire boat, set out with the first direct airmail for Australia. Just over two hours out from Southampton, she flew into a wooded French hillside. All six on board were killed, except the radio operator. Hugh Gordon was immediately dispatched to France and ordered to find out what had happened. While investigating the crash site, Hugh filmed these unique and previously unseen images of the Capricornus's demise. You can imagine what a, a large flying boat is like when it flies into a mountain at about 150, 160 miles an hour. It's a bit of a mess. I had to go out there. Hugh could do little more than break up the wreckage for scrap. The crash had been caused by a frozen altimeter and a confused navigator. Thinking they were a thousand feet higher than they actually were, the Capricornus flew into a mountain the pilot never saw in the mist. This was not an isolated incident. Of the first 28 Empire boats built, nine crashed or were damaged in accidents. Despite the setbacks, each new aircraft and every flight was another step towards the greatest challenge of all, the Atlantic.
breaks at center parks everyone is different for a brochure call 08705 200 222 when you make beautiful glassware you want it to shine brilliantly wash after wash after wash that's why leading manufacturers recommend only finish meet the experts of PC World okay what seems to be the problem Dr. Shaw my computer's dead there's nothing on the screen it's our job to find the right solution for every customer we have over 600 trained technicians here but you'll only come through to one technical advisor to solve your problem that for me, please. and press delete delete we have advisors working 24 hours a day 7 days a week 365 days a year okay. this will reinstall your driver and then press ok and that will restart your PC ok and that has now solved your problem thank you ok anything else okay? He'll close the study door, phone first direct, and the next minute he'll be roaring with laughter. He will be flirting on the phone with them, having a great time. We'll come out and say, I've done the banking, and I'm supposed to be impressed by the banking that he's done. But it's relaxing. It's efficient and it's accurate. It must be. There's a really nice person at the other end every time. There is one girl in Glasgow. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Tell me about I've her. I've quite worked out a shift pattern. <laughs> She's not as nice as me, is she? No, dear. <laughs> Allied has always been famous for its carpets. But these days, there's a whole lot more in store, like beautiful beds in all shapes and sizes, acres of wood and laminate flooring, rugs galore, and of course, carpets. Call free for your nearest store. Now celebrating 50 years, there's more to Allied. Watch a film in a stressless sofa, and the real excitement is off-screen. The ultimate TV sofa with individually reclining seats that move in harmony with you. Stressless, the film lover's choice. Free phone 0800 652 0800 for free brochure and nearest stockist. In 1936, a flying boat could take you from San Francisco to Hawaii or from Rome to Alexandria, but not across the Atlantic. The only thing that could was the giant German airship, the Hindenburg. And so when they were in Europe, Mr. and Mrs. Tripp had no choice if they were determined to fly home to America. The head of Pan Am became a passenger on the Hindenburg. My mother's descriptions of that trip were really quite interesting. It was a, an austere type of environment, but she was fascinated in retrospect, sitting there at the, the picture of Hitler down at the end of the dining room and the very German service. It was a claustrophobic experience, and uh, she was quite happy to get off. Some thought the Hindenburg offered the viable future for air services across the Atlantic until one evening in May 1937. But as the passengers crowded the windows to watch, a roar and a burst of flame near the big tail fins turned the ship into a flaming inferno. The airship service ended in tragedy, killing 36 people. It will be two years before any other fair-paying passengers could fly across the Atlantic. During that time, Pan Am and Imperial struggled to cross the Atlantic, the biggest commercial prize of all, with a viable passenger service. 
there was a, a lot of competition for the North Atlantic. That was the money route around in different places of the world, but that was the really lucrative place to go, and everybody wanted in on it. The determination of the two great airlines to cross the Atlantic finally overcame the political obstacles and led to a negotiated settlement. The British, Irish, Canadian and US governments agreed to a treaty where all would mutually benefit from any airline service across the Atlantic. The agreement they finally came to was that Pan Am would not start service across the North Atlantic before Imperial Airways would start. Um, and in exchange for that, there would be an exclusivity. Uh, Pan Am had the exclusive right to fly the North Atlantic. Um, obviously, Imperial Airways had it from the British point of view. The initial result of these agreements was that both airlines could attempt their first limited service across part of the Atlantic, between New York and Bermuda, the mid-Atlantic British colony. From Britain, Bermuda was too far to fly, and so Imperial had to ship the Cavalier flying boat in pieces and then reassemble her. The Imperial Airways flying boat Cavalier arrives in New York at the end of the first survey flight from Bermuda, the southern holiday resort where thousands of wealthy Americans spend the winter. And New York gets a glimpse of the superb lines of Britain's new flying boats, the Air Armada that will soon be spanning the world. The Cavalier started operating successfully from June 1937, as did Pan Am's Bermuda Clipper. Even on this modest 700-mile journey, the Atlantic was able to remind travelers of its power. Betty Tripp made the six-hour Bermuda run many times. The air was often very rough. The aircraft would be tossed around and with no warning would drop hundreds of feet. Meals were often flung in the air, landing on passengers, on the ceilings, or in the aisle. On one occasion, we had to return to Bermuda as we'd used up so much gas in fighting the winds. Crossing the whole Atlantic would require a series of test or survey flights to explore the severity of the conditions. To go to the North Atlantic, we had a problem of weather. Weather was, was pretty mean. The survey flights commenced in the summer of 1937, when the weather was at its calmest. Imperial's Caledonia had to be stripped bare and filled with four times its usual load of fuel. It would depart from Ireland and head for Newfoundland, the shortest distance across the Atlantic. The Imperial flying boat Caledonia prepares to leave Foynes in Ireland for her transatlantic flight to Newfoundland. Simultaneously, Pan Am's Clipper III left New York for Newfoundland and then Ireland. They had to face bad visibility, the possibility of uh, fuel leaks, engine failures. All of these things gave a problem of immense proportions. While the Caledonia is roaring westwards, the US Pan American Clipper is coming east, and the two giants actually pass in mid-ocean. Both flights are superbly successful, and now the American Clipper glides down to the smooth waters of Point Bay. Not all the test flights went so well. Imperial's Cambria got lost in fog, the radio broke, and then the autopilot failed. After 18 hours battling the conditions, the exhausted crew landed in Newfoundland, almost out of fuel. The survey flights proved the Empire flying boats could only cross the Atlantic in good conditions and without passengers or the mail. So until both airlines had the physical capability with the aircraft that could do it, they really had to postpone it. And I think Pan Am used to say, well, we're frustrated because we can't start. But in fact, they really didn't have the aircraft at the time to start service as soon as they might have liked to. As carrying passengers proved impossible in 1937, Imperial remained determined to explore every option in their attempt to carry letters across the Atlantic. First up, Shorts created the extraordinary Mercury Meyer composite aircraft. The idea was to save on the huge amount of fuel used in takeoff 
by using the Maya to lift the mail-carrying mercury into the air. The smaller mercury would then be released to fly on with the mail. In July 1938, one of Imperial's most legendary pioneering captains, Don Bennett, later an Air Vice Marshal in the RAF, flew the Mercury almost 3,000 miles to Montreal, Canada. Bennett and his radio operator then flew on to New York and into the record books as the first commercial aircraft to fly across the North Atlantic and the first crossing to Montreal. The Mercury Maya was just one of many experiments. The late 1930s witnessed a host of exploratory crossings as various nations tried everything they could think of to carry the mail to America. The Germans experimented with a series of giant catapult ships that flung seaplanes into the air with enough fuel to then make it over the Atlantic. Others suggested building some kind of moored landing area in mid-Atlantic, while the French proposed building an island and resurrected an ancient flying boat that barely staggered across. The Germans shocked the world again when the Fokker Wolf Condor land plane arrived in New York, having flown non-stop from Berlin. But the Condor could also not make the journey with an economic cargo, and the US denied her further landing rights. And finally, Imperial experimented with the revolutionary technique of in-flight refueling for their Empire flying boats. Despite all this endeavor, by the end of 1938, Imperial had only one flying boat operating over any part of the Atlantic Ocean, the Cavalier that linked Bermuda with New York. In January 1939, the Cavalier left New York on a 290th scheduled flight. 10.30 on a lowering, foreboding morning, the Imperial Airways Cavalier takes off from New York, heads out through troubled skies over the Atlantic. Little do her eight passengers and five crew realize that tragedy rides at the controls. Then shore radio stations hear of trouble, bad weather, all engines failing through ice. Finally, the fatal message sinking. American Coast Guard and Army planes speed to the search with just one chance in a million finding the survivors bobbing on the icy, lashing Atlantic. And now our American commentator brings the end of the tragic story. And the SOB town did the impossible. Its gallant captain and crew found and rescued the 10 survivors and rushed them to New York. Anxious relatives waited to welcome their loved ones, but three did not come back. Injured, they let go precious life preservers and were lost. As the Baytown comes alongside the dock, it brings a weary cargo of refugees from the sky and sea. The Cavalier's engines had frozen up and brought her down. Imperial had nothing to replace her with, yet again the Atlantic had defeated the aviator and airlines. The culmination of all this trial and error would be a wholly new flying boat that would take on the Atlantic in 1939, the product of a corporation that would remain synonymous with global travel to this day. The first Boeing airliner was about to take off. But would it rise to the airline's ultimate challenge and make crossing the Atlantic commercially viable? I think you'll find him rather persuasive. Compromise is not possible! He's insane. A complete psychotic. I could see into his eyes, but I saw it was terrifying. What does it mean? It means the unconquerable. Robert Carlyle, Stockard Channing, Matthew Modine, Juliana Margulies. Hitler, The Rise of Evil. Saturday at 9 on 4. Even in the most turbulent times, Scottish widows has stood firm. Using its strength, experience, and investment expertise to guide its customers year after year after year. Scottish Widows for life, pensions, and investments. Marie Antoinette, Madame Guillotine, vous attend. 
fait aujourd'hui Je n'ai peur que j'ai mal à la tête. Excusez-moi, votre majesté. Headache What headache Meet the experts of PC World. These days we're thinking more mobile than ever, like this superb new Packard Bell Power Plus laptop. It features a recordable DVD drive and Intel Centrino mobile technology, so you can connect to the internet without wires. It's just 999. Now that's stamping down on prices. Centrino technology also. At PC World now. PC World. I ho 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 I don't suppose I'd be much good at that. <laughs> Use your head. Teach. Having a lucky day? You should play Daily Play, this new draw from the National Lottery. There's loads of prizes to be won, and you can win up to 30 grand all to yourself. The new Daily Play draw. Win up to £30,000. Heart disease may be the UK's biggest killer, but your risk could be significantly reduced. Early detection and treatment could help stop it progressing. At Bupa, we take wellness as seriously as illness. From health information, to health checks, to heart operations. We have a range of ways to help keep you ticking, whether or not you choose to become a Booper member. Call 0800 00 1010. June 1938, and on the lake beside the Boeing plant in Seattle, the largest commercial flying boat ever built was launched. This footage of it has never been seen before. The new Leviathan, christened the Boeing B-314, would be Pan Am's contender for the challenge of running a passenger airline service across the Atlantic. Britain's Imperial Airways, on the other hand, pinned their Atlantic hopes on the Golden Hind, a greatly enhanced version of its classic Empire flying boat that operated throughout the British territories. More than a match for the 314 on paper, but in early 1939, still unfinished. The race was now on. The earlier agreement that said both airlines had to operate simultaneously was ripped up. Pan Am now had permission to fly to Britain after June 1939 even if Imperial was not able to fly the route. National pride demanded Imperial Airways offer a rival service. Racing ahead, in March 1939, Eleanor Roosevelt launched another B-314. The plane will enter the transatlantic trade flying the flag of the United States. With a roar of 6,000 horsepower, some 40 tons of winged metal lifts off the water and heads into the skyway. Finally, Imperial's Golden Hind was launched in June.
well named as Britain's new airliner, the largest we have ever built. Today she's launched at the short works at Rochester, Britain's answer to the Pan American Clipper. Soon this great new flying boat will be roaring across the Empire's skyways, insecting the globe in a hundredth part of the time it took Drake's famous ship to sail the seven seas. The new Skyliner rides the water for the first time and George in his little rowing boat takes over. Keep going George, you're doing fine. The Golden Hind will have a non-stop cruising range of 6,000 miles. And to our competitors, that's some answer. A few days later, on the 28th of June, 18 passengers boarded the Pan Am Dixie Clipper in New York. One of them was Mrs. Betty Tripp. This was such a dramatic moment for me. I had lived so closely with the various problems involved in establishing the service across the Atlantic, I could hardly believe it was finally happening. I was excited and thrilled beyond words, and not one bit nervous or apprehensive. I counted 49 seconds before I saw the last sign of spray leave the keel. The great winged ship took to the air, ready to tackle the Atlantic. The Boeing 314 was an absolutely fantastic airplane. It was really the queen of the sky and the model of luxury. The passengers had paid about 5,000 pounds in today's terms to board this high-flying hotel, roughly the fare for Concorde. The dinner was delicious and beautifully served. In 1939, the fastest luxury liner took four and a half days, yet here we were crossing in 24 hours. Everything seemed so routine and matter of fact that we almost lost sight of the fact that this was the first airplane flight to carry passengers to Europe. My mind kept racing, thinking of a million things I must remember to tell Juan. I was cold, the heat should be more I remember my mother made notes to herself, I've got to tell Juan I've, that uh, we need more blankets on board. She was also very critical in the early days why you couldn't get a drink on board, although people would sneak their drink on board, they'd bring their bottles on, and in some cases they got quite drunk. During the night, we seemed to hang suspended in the sky along with the stars while the clouds floated slowly by beneath us. When the sun came up, it seemed as if we had returned to Earth. We hardly knew when we touched the water that the landing was so perfect. After refueling in the Azores, they arrived 24 hours after leaving New York. Excited with exultation at so fast a trip and that we had landed in Europe. Pan Am then commenced weekly commercial services across the Atlantic. The American airline had won the race. There's no question that the preeminent feeling was, be the first, and the Boeing 314 just did it. And it made a lot of money, as well as prestige for Pan America. So this is the new luxury hotel of the sky. If they get much bigger, we shall have to put wings on the Queen Mary. The Atlantic had finally met its match. The Boeing 314 was an aviation marvel. The years of flights and tests had culminated in a technological revolution. With the longest wingspan then built, the 314 covered the 2,400 miles to the Azores at 160 miles per hour. Well, the BC 314 was a very easy airplane to fly. You were able to accelerate and get it up to flying speed raise your flaps and away you went. All metal, each one cost over a million dollars and was almost half the size of a jumbo jet. By the start of the Second World War, Boeing had produced six of the first truly global airliners. The B-314s had conquered the world's oceans. Imperial's great hope, the Golden Hind, would never fly commercially over the Atlantic. Following her test flights, she was taken into military service by the RAF. After Pearl Harbor, Pan Am quickly joined up and also became part of the Allied war machine. As did a trio of B-314s the British bought in 1941 
to continue the service across the Atlantic. Even in war, the great flying boats continued to carry the most illustrious passengers. After his first wartime summit with President Roosevelt in 1942, Winston Churchill faced a choice about how to return home via Bermuda. Churchill was considering the time it would take him by sea, uh, which uh, meant, in fact, something of the order of 10 days. This he hadn't got time to spare. So he took the flying boat and fell in love with it straight away. He arrived just 20 hours later to the astonishment and acclaim of all his parliamentarian friends and he never looked back. He traveled on the flying boat from thereafter. And Shorts played a critical role in winning a bigger battle of the Atlantic with its 700 Sunderlands. This military sister of the Empire boats served with great distinction in the RAF's coastal command, protecting convoys rescuing down pilots and hunting U-boats. By the end of the war, the age of the great flying boats had ended. Times had moved on. The world was now covered with fixed runways and bomber technology had proven the long-range capabilities of land planes. Cheaper to build and easier to pressurize, the future of long-haul civil aviation, which the flying boats had pioneered, now belonged to land-based aircraft. Today, none of the great pre-war flying boats survive. A brief but wonderful age, less than a decade long, and barely using 150 flying boats, had passed. But while those who flew in a flying boat still live, it will not be forgotten. Every day was a pleasant day in the flying boats. We had good food, and the airplanes flew well, and it was a luxury airplane. I enjoyed every minute of it. Going on a flying boat, yes, it was an honor. And I think people who went on flying boats perhaps made a journey they would never forget, a journey of a lifetime. The advent of the Clippers crossing the, the Atlantic shrank the world, and it was the beginning of the shrinking of the world. It continued to shrink. Nothing quite compares with it. I've flown many types of aeroplane for and since. Nothing compares with the flying boat, nothing. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. It was magic, absolute magic. Why not relive those exciting years at channel4.com slash science. Next week, it's the golden age of the train at the same time. But coming up, how Mrs. Thatcher used special forces in front of the camera and also under secret conditions. SAS The Real Story continues next. Film 4 kicks off a season of high-octane movies this October with Ang Lee's awesome action epic Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Sheer adrenaline. Watch Film 4 every night in October at 10 for some of the wildest moments in movie history. Get all Film 4 channels now. Call free on 0800 44 1234. Humans sometimes like just to sit and do nothing. But that's not always the best policy. Because if you dig out your tax return and send it to the Inland Revenue by September the 30th, they'll work out the tax calculation for you. So then you can do something a little more exciting. Self-assessment. Tax doesn't have to be taxing. <laughs> the English believe it's a slur on your host's food if you don't clear your plate. Mm. Whereas the Chinese feel you're questioning their generosity if you do. Okay. 
At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. Forget! HSBC, the world's local bank.